Welcome to AIM High Live. I'm your host, Jim Park. Today, I'm joined by one of the newest members of AIM, Wen Xiao, managing partner of Cypress Capital Group. I have an interesting discussion with Wen regarding a strategy focused on real estate investments in markets with high venture spend. Wen, welcome. Excited to talk to you about your real estate fund business and how you see the market kind of progressing uh, in the years ahead. Um, how did you get into the business and why, why real estate? Well, I actually first started um, in fixed income sales and trading for the first 25 years of my career, working in New York, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. But in about 2006, um, I started our family office, and I moved back. And as a CIO, where I was trained to be professionally, I looked around at all the asset classes we can invest in. Yeah. And I came across a really amazing research piece that showed over a 20-plus year time frame real estate had the high sharp ratio. And not only the highest sharp ratio, but it had the absolute highest return and the lowest vol. For those people that don't know what a sharp ratio is, will you describe what that is? It's the highest return with the lowest volatility. So we measure um, asset class returns by sharp ratio. It's a consistent investment over the past 20 years that went up by a certain percentage, 7 8% every year, whatever the number was, right? Uh, how did your first three funds do? The first three funds we invested in New York and Silicon Valley. We target 20 to 30%. We've achieved that. And in the stress test, live stress test of, of 2020, for example, when COVID came and hit, uh, we still had a positive return uh, of positive 2%. So it isn't just the 20, 30 percent that we're excited about to talk about, but it's really the preservation of uh, capital so that when it goes down, that positive 2 percent really allows us to sleep well. A lot of um, active hedge fund managers are not able to achieve that. One of the first questions you ask is to achieve this, how much do I have to give up in my returns to do that? And so the Sortino ratio, which people use to measure upside and downside return, of our returns are quite attractive. So why those two markets that you talked about, uh, Silicon Valley and New York? Why, why are those markets interesting to you? Well, our investment thesis is very simple. We invest in residential properties in tech center cities. And tech is clearly both in the public and private markets where wealth has been created for at least the last 20 years. And we follow where venture capital spending is. And so in 2000, the market share of New York and Silicon Valley was about 40%. So 40% of all the VC spending in the US was in New York and Silicon Valley. And you would think that if you read the public press that everyone's moving Florida, everybody's moving Denver and so forth, that in the last 20 years, you would think that 40% market share would have declined. But in fact, that is not true. That 40% in the year 2020 became 65%. So we define these two tech center cities as where the technology is. Silicon Valley, even New York, a lot of people moved out, right? They left the city. Um, a lot of them obviously are moving back in a big way. But, but does that, has that changed the nature of where people want to live and work nowadays? So there was a lot of debate in 2020 with the hybrid work model and so forth that everybody's moving out of New York. And all the data has shown that was not true. And we want to talk about universal truth. Ray Dalio talks about a universal truth is something that's true over time and over all geographies. And one of the things that's a universal truth is urbanization. There's a very good TED talk by Jeffrey West. And in it, he says that when we live in an urban center, we are 10% more efficient as a society. This is where we have great accountants, great lawyers. This is where congregation of talent is. I never thought lawyers made your life better, but okay, so I'll, 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 I'll give you a pass on that. You know what? <laughs> when you need a lawyer, you want a really damn good lawyer. <laughs> Urbanization is happening. All the developed yes. countries are pretty well urbanized. Places like China going through, yes. continues to go through massive urbanization, right? And so that's certainly happening. But, but this whole mindset change of a lot of folks of wanting to live with bigger space, yes. less cities, it, you don't think that's going to be a trend that's going to be long lasting? The people who are moving from the cities, for example, we're here in New York, from New York to the suburbs are the traditional families who need more space. 
They have two kids now. They need a backyard for their dog and their kids. Yeah. That has always been happening. But the COVID impact did not accelerate that, all right? People are still coming to cities because this is where the jobs are. Well, some of the critique that I've heard among housing advocates and people are, hey, um, there, we're already short on supply, right? People, there, right now the, I think nationwide inventory is sitting at like two months or something like that, very, really low. Um, why would you crowd out the regular home buyers uh, by have, allowing all these investors to come in and start buying up properties and so on and pushing up price? A typical investment in California would be, we would buy an original home built in 1950s mm -hmm. and we buy it and it's very run down. You would not want to be living there. So we tear it down and we build new supply. It's very true, you want to bring down cost of homes, cost of rent, cost of rent. you want to, simple Econ 101, increase supply. So we do our job of increasing supply. So we increase supply, we build beautiful homes that are architecturally design winning, and we, com you know, we donate to our community. We donate 10% of our profits in back into the community that we're, you know, we're citizens of. So we're very um, proud of the fact that we think we're a positive impact. You're one of the few Asian American real estate funds I've run across. Josh Lerner did a study of different asset class, number of Asian American own their funds, right? Real estate funds. Maybe 0.2% of real estate funds are Asian founded and run. How, how is it that you're in it? And why is it that we don't have more people in it? You know, I'm not a soothsayer. I don't have an answer to that. I would certainly like to see more of us. Um, you know, Asian Americans typically love real estate. We love the asset class. Um, and I would love to see more of us get involved as founders of these funds, um, and I think our community can certainly help each other to do that, foster that growth, um, and hopefully as we, through AIM, this is very hard of the reason why we're corporate sponsors, is we love your mission. Now it's our mission too, is we want to promote Asian Americans of all sorts to be founders of their own investment management companies. I mean, you're, you're already successful. But I hope that you continue to demonstrate um, for the community what you can do. You not only are an uh, important part of the industry, but you're an important part of sort of representing our community, uh, particularly in the real estate space. Um, any other last thoughts on, you know, the future of real estate? I mean, you know, the Fed's going to keep moving the rates up, right? That's going to dampen a little bit of the demand for real estate. Um, how do you see that playing out in terms of your business strategy? You know, are, are you going to tamper down your investment, your, your, your purchase? Or are you going to change it? Or, or what, what's your thinking around that? Well, I think it's very important to think about where Fed funds is today relative to the historical context. Now, according to the Fed funds dot plot, by 2024, we should be at 2.75% Fed funds. If you take a look at the last boom times of 2007 before the great financial crisis, Fed funds were at 5%. So even if we get to 2.75, which is, seems like a lot from zero, we are still historically very, you know, the interest rates and inv inflation environment are still very conducive to all sorts of investing, not just real estate. So I really don't think the Fed is taking away the punch bowl. Um, and so I think that if it works out the way we all expect today, real estate will do very well. One, real estate is the best inflation hedge of all asset classes. I personally don't believe that inflation will be here as a permanent situation like it was in the 1980s. I still believe that the supply shock of COVID is temporary, transitory. Transitory may be more than six months, right? but it's not permanent. And of course, we just had a Ukraine invasion. But all of this in the system, I do not believe is a permanent inflationary shock. I believe, okay, as a macro thinker, that the world is still facing deflationary pressure. You see that in OECD countries, such as in Europe and Japan, they continue to fight deflationary pressure. Mm -hmm. 
And really, we are very blessed in this country to still have a very vibrant economy. But I think as we age, as nations age, we will face more and more deflationary pressure. And some of that deflationary pressure is brought on through produ productivity gains through AI and robotics, right? There's a healthy debate where AI and robots will be as a net impact to society. I live in Palo Alto. I also live here in New York. And we invest quite a bit in technology. And what happens in 20 years, according to Kai-Fu Lee, who's the number one investor in AI, because he's founded more billion dollar companies in AI than anybody else, says that in 20 years, 85% of the jobs may be subject to redundancy because of AI and robots. AIs and robots don't need a house. Right. People do, right? Yes. So what are we gonna do? I mean, I, I, you know, people need jobs, so are there, what's gonna happen with the income? I mean, because that's what you need to pay your bills. You know, uh, will the housing market, you know, be sustainable over the long haul given these issues of, you know, being replaced by the bots and, you know, AIs of the world? So we think about that a lot. And we think that 20 years from now is almost like tomorrow. And if you think that offices is going to be get, getting impacted because of the hybrid work model, well, just as you say, what if there are less worker needs then office space is going to get hit just like retail has been hit by technology because of Amazon. We think that is front and center and bullseye of technology. But there will still be 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet and we still need to live somewhere. There's been a lot of debate about universal income as a way to solve that solution. I don't know. But we as a society need to think about what are we going to do if things aren't just all rosy. So we think about that. So we also invest in tech center cities, not because it's a go-go market of upside. Yeah. We also think of it as a great defensive play. And as a bond, a former bond professional, I'm much more bearish all the time than I am optimistic. And so I always think, what will I do if that bearish scenario comes out? And God forbid, there are no jobs out there. We believe just as the Fed takes away the punch bowl, takes away liquidity, liquidity goes and recedes back to the core. And so the core will be tier one markets yeah. like New York and San Francisco. And there may be a real challenge for a tier two and tier three cities to do well in that environment. So are you bullish on any other markets uh, other than New York and San Francisco? Obviously there's a big, there's a lot of money sitting here. Uh, but are there, I mean, there are other tech centers that are popping yes. up throughout the country. Or are you looking at other markets to invest in? In the last 14 years, everything has become very bubbly. You could go to almost any city in the world and they will say they are the Silicon Valley of whatever. Right. But when the tide recedes, then there will be a stress test, which is a real tech center city. We follow the venture capital spending. And Austin, to answer your question, we believe is a city that has reached critical mass that will only go up. But even so, Austin is only something like 2% of all VC spending in the US, let alone some of the other smaller cities. But we feel that Austin, being in the middle of the country, uh, politically different, so that it is not a substitution for New York and California, is a real complement to our investment thesis of tech center cities in New York, California, and Austin. So we really love Austin. It's a great town. So there's a lot of young folks there, uh, innovation happening. I guess one, one question is, like people talk about the bubble all the time. Like, you know, when you see 20% appreciation on an annualized basis for multiple years, people go, okay, are we in for another 2008, right? Yes. Uh, why won't the future not be a 2008 experience, in your view? We're always fighting the last battle, all right? And the next recession or the next great financial crisis will not come from 
that last battle, which was caused by housing bubble. And in fact, banks now are so highly regulated in terms of lending and all of that, that is absolutely the last place where we're going to find a bubble forming. And you'll see this now. Why is it that housing prices are increasing so much? Because of the lack of investment. Because new home constructions are recovered only like 50% of the 2007 peak. So you can you know, Google the permits that are in every city um, that is going to be available. So we are really short on supply. So you can say right now housing is at an all-time high. But that's true for the last 100 years. Every year can almost be a new high, except for cyclical downturns. Mm -hmm. But we specifically do not believe housing because the lack of over leverage, the lack of supply means that there will not be that bubble formation, right? A bubble, a classic definition of a bubble is expansion of credit and the credit contracts. There has been very little expansion of credit in housing. Banks have specifically been asked by regulators to lend a lot, okay, not back to the good old days of, you know, 1% down or whatever it is. You have to fully put down 20% equity. And many times you have to put in more than that, 30%. So most of the leverage out there in the system now, um, even when you go out there in, um, uh, you know, the gray market for non-bank uh, financing, you cannot borrow more than typically 20, 25 percent of equity that you need to put down. So an LTC loan to cost of about 75 percent is where they will max out. So there's a lot of equity in all the deals out there now not to cause a bubble um, yeah. bursting. Yeah, I, I, think, I think those are good points. Um, you know, it's a, a different market. Um, we're not oversupplied like yes. it was. We weren't easy credit is not available anymore. Um, so I think those are good points to point to. But I, um, I want to thank you for being a part of this program. I do uh, wish you the best uh, as one of the one of the leaders in the Asian American communities focused on the real estate business. Um, you know, as you say, we want more uh, in our community to be embracing this sector of the, the economy and, and this um, uh, investment um, asset class. And um, yeah, we, we look forward to working with you on that in the future. So thanks again, Wen, for your time and for the chat. Thank you so much, Jim. We're really proud to be uh, sponsors, corporate sponsors of uh, your organization, and we think it's a great mission. Thanks a lot. Thank you.